You're listening to Sunny Side Up, a B2B podcast that brings you the juiciest insights from go to market leaders and practitioners. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Sunny Side Up podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Saucedo. Today, I'm super excited to talk to Rennie Fidlin on navigating the ABM landscape. As a VP of marketing at Sprout Loud, Rennie is responsible for building a predictable, repeatable revenue engine. He oversees all of Sprout Loud's branding, marketing programs, product marketing, revenue operations, and sales development, which I'm sure is no small feat. With over 25 years in strategy and marketing, Rennie has spent the last decade scaling high growth enterprise B2B SaaS and technology companies. Prior to Sprout Loud, Fidlin has led global marketing teams at Aria Systems, Optimize, Softmart, which was later acquired by Connection, and Audience Partners, also acquired by uh, Altus USA. Rennie holds a bachelor's degree in communications from the University of Pennsylvania. When not immersed in data, Fidlin spends most of his free time traveling, watching movies, and playing games with his wife and three children. Rennie, I'm super excited to have you on the show, and welcome. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Now, to get started, um, I, I'd really like to kind of talk more about your journey through ABM. Obviously, as, as over 25 years, you know, handling uh, marketing at various businesses, you have an extensive background in marketing. So curious if you could share with our listeners more about your journey through account-based marketing over the years, what led you to specialize in this field, and also maybe how you've seen ABM evolve over the years, understanding that you've been using it essentially since its inception. Yeah, sure. So... I realized pretty early on in my career that the old lead based model um, that marketing typically used at the time really wasn't working, especially for an enterprise B2B sale. Um, mm-hmm. Typically in an enterprise sale, there is um, multiple people in the buying group making the decisions and you know the activities of an individual person really were not a good indicator of whether that uh, account was likely to be in market. Um, so for marketing to be successful, um, you know, I realized, again, we really had to align with the way that sellers have always been selling, right, which is means at an account level. Um, in the early days of ABM, you know, we really, you, we really helped sellers by prioritizing their outreach, by giving them insight into which accounts were visiting our website at an anonymous level. And that was really all that we were able to provide them to or pride for them. As the, uh, you know, tools advanced, we started being able to target those accounts with digital advertising, which was wonderful, right? And now we're able to build dynamic audiences based on pretty much any characteristic that we can think of, you know, in our CRM, in our, um, in our uh, marketing automation, uh, in, you know, the account-based platform itself or, or firmographics, right? Um, this was all done manually in the past, right? Mm. Just think about that. Like we, we would go in and we would pull these lists and then we would manually remove or add accounts on, you know, a regular cadence in order to make sure that we were targeting, for example, accounts that, you know, were in our pipeline or in the opportunity stage. So uh, lots of advances along the way. Yeah. And two things you said that I really gravitate to is, you know, you can't, oh, like someone downloaded an ebook, we sent them a few leads, they're obviously ready to buy, right? <laughs> and so that's a common misconception in B2B, right? Especially with folks that do rely on just purely content syndication or other lead generation methods. But, you know, you're going, it sounds like most of the practices, even throughout the evolution was, let's go back to, to giving the sellers what they need based on how they already operate and let them scale those efforts in a more strategic way through prioritization and insights, which I, I think is really one of the true value points of an ABM approach. So glad to hear you say that, but it totally makes sense. And then sounds like when you were able to layer on things like advertising and other components that you could still use an account-based approach, just further kind of took um, the way you used it at scale to another level. So yeah, I mean, you know, the reality is that marketing has always been in a support function. Mm-hmm. We support the sales motions, right? We expand them 
we you know help prioritize who to go after um, but we are supporting the sales motions the go-to-market motions yeah if, there's something interesting that i keep seeing as far as a trend which is whether or not marketing should even own sdrs for example which i, I think is a very hot topic <laughs> and very it, it probably could uh, spend significant time debating on whether or not that's appropriate but it's something i can't help but notice um that seems to be a common debate as of late at least in the world of linkedin so we it's interesting a whole show on that alone <laughs> <laughs> I, I i agree as well but uh i will say you know knowing that you have so much vast experience and you've had to adapt over the years to different um, environments, of course, through different organizations, but even overall, like ABM does present its challenges. Um, you know, it's a crucial strategy, but I'm curious to know, like, maybe what are some kind of common flaws and challenges that you still see marketing teams struggling with when implementing ABM? And maybe how should they go about addressing those challenges more effectively? Yeah, so one of the biggest things that I see all the time um, is people trying to align their um, campaigns to a buyer's journey at the account level. Mm. Right? Sounds reasonable. Problem is, is that not all the members of a buying group or the influences of that buying group are in the same place in their buyer's journey. Just because the champion knows who you are and how you're differentiated in the marketplace doesn't mean the economic buyer does, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, I find it, um, you know, uh, much more effective when marketing is trying to reach those people that sales can't to stay much more top of funnel, um, mm -hmm. even for those accounts that are in our pipeline, because the people that I am trying to reach and influence may not have any idea who we are at this stage. And then the, a, a second challenge that I see all the time is the challenge of proving the success of your ABM programs, mm -hmm. right? So typically, um, most companies aren't willing to take their best accounts and create control groups where they don't do any outreach just to show that ABM is working. Uh, and you always get the chicken and egg question, you know, is the account showing intent, activity, engagement because we are reaching out to them through marketing and sales? Or did we identify them as showing that intent prior to our outreach and then do the outreach? The reality is the current tools aren't there yet to answer those questions. And in the end, as much as you know, the C-suite would love to be able to say, if I inject another $50,000 into your budget, will I get, you know, 500,000 in pipeline? You just can't get quite there yet, right? You can mm -hmm. draw, you can't draw direct lines between a lot of what we are doing from an activity perspective uh, to that ROI. Yeah, you raise a great point, especially right now when, you know, budgets are definitely more under the microscope and more scrutinized. There is a need to defend basically everything within your tech stack. And uh, I think for a lot of folks, MarTech is very hard to defend, uh, especially when it comes to being able to showcase ROI. So that does lead me to some curiosity in terms of, you know, throughout your years, obviously, ABM has been a critical part of how you really scale your marketing motions. But how I, I would like to know, you know, to that point, uh, especially, you know, in conditions this year, how do you showcase ROI or convince senior leadership or your executive team that the tool is actually having an influence maybe when there isn't an easy way due to maybe lack of tools, attribution, other factors that you can't tangibly show that influence? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, um, I'll give you an example of what I've done recently. Sure. Um, I was able, you know, it was a lot of manual work, but mm -hmm. I was able to show that accounts that we identified as marketing qualified converted at into opportunities at twice the rate of accounts that we didn't. Right. To me, that's a, um, a powerful stat to be able to show, right? Literally two X the rate, for the ones that we identified versus the ones that we didn't. Now I admitted to them and I'll admit here, there is a little bit of bias in that 
in that part of identifying them as a marketing qualified account is the fact that they are interacting with our website and other marketing materials. Mm-hmm. Um, and but you know at the same time, you know without the ABM tools, we would have never known that. We would have never known that those accounts were interacting with our website because the only people that we would know are interacting with our website are people who fill out forms. And frankly, that's just not a reasonable thing to ask people anymore. No, no. Um, It it still pains me when, you know, we see a lot of folks, they do a ton of, of advertising at scale and it goes straight to a gated microsite. And yep. you can't access any content without providing information. You can't even navigate throughout the rest of their website to really explore and do your own research before maybe you are you know, mentally convinced to say, yes, they can have my email address, my cell phone number. I'm expecting to get blown up as soon as I hit the, yes, send me this ebook <laughs> call to action. But uh, yeah, I just don't understand that either because there is a lot of hesitancy there is even in more cases situations, and I, I I'll be honest, I've done this myself, where you know I've put fake information just because I'm interested in the content. Doesn't necessarily mean I'm interested in immediately buying your product. And so, yeah, um, especially in in situations, and this is actually something we've seen with Gartner, where you know I think it's up to over ninety percent of a buyer's time is done without the sales rep, which means they are doing their research. You need to make it easier for them to do that research or they're going to find another competitive product that's doing it the right way. And they can feel like that they're involved in that buying process because they've been able to make those decisions themselves. So yeah, I've heard less than 5% of a buyer's time is sent is spent with a sales rep. Yeah, it's incredible. It's painful for me as a sales rep personally, but <laughs> yes. uh, it's an amazing stat. Yeah. But, you know, I think that's one thing where businesses that are doing it right, you know, for example, they have self, you know, product tours, which are ungated, right? They have, you know, a plethora of content that is accessible. There's very, very few stuff that is gated. And then there is appropriate times and use cases for gated content. I think it's primarily more with folks that you're already engaged with to your earlier point versus like, if I'm getting this traffic to the site, I need to maximize that traffic and sending them through a, you know, a kind of a walled garden through gated assets usually doesn't yield tangible results. So I'm glad you mentioned that. But that first challenge too really screams in my ear uh, as well, you know, as as I think ABM and its next evolution is kind of going more towards that buying group audience. But uh, I, I think you said something that's very uh, valuable to our listeners in terms of understanding that not everyone in that buyer's group is in the same place or in that same mindset. And I love the fact that you're taking approach of, you know, depending on where some of those buyers are at, continue to pass them marketing. So that way in situations like you mentioned, where sales can't necessarily reach them, they're still getting air cover. Marketing can still show influence. And then if you do actually have that alignment between sales and marketing, that kind of approach should pay dividends in most cases. So, yeah, definitely something uh, I, I'm going to keep in mind as you know we engage with more customers that are interested in best practices for targeting buying groups. And I think you definitely nailed that there uh, without a doubt. So. Let's kind of shift a bit uh, here into maybe more of like best practices. Um, You mentioned some challenges, but I'd like to hear as well, maybe, um, you know, for for our marketers, uh, particularly in the SaaS field that are looking to enhance their ABM strategy and also maximize the impact of their ABM solution. What key best practices would you recommend based on your experience and success uh, throughout your tenure? Yeah, I'll tell you right now and this is true for me too, the, really the key is um, determining what is it that's going to predict likelihood to be in market. Regardless of what platform you're using or what intent signals you're getting, right? Um, there is a model that every marketer needs to build for their business that's going to be a good predictor of intent. And it's not a set it and forget it type thing. It's something that needs to continually evolve and improve and be optimized. You know, when you're looking at all of the things you could use in order to determine what a marketing qualified account is, for example, right, is, you know, third party intent on ad supported websites really relevant to your product or would 
G2 reviews or trust radius comparisons be more relevant, right? Um, for me, what I use primarily right now is first party intent, which is mm -hmm. those visitations to my website and to really the selling section of my website um, as the, the best predictor of likelihood to be in market. No, that's great. And, um, you know, I think through an ABM tool, uh, something else that, that really sticks out to me um, that you mentioned, and, and even something I use in my own practice, is that we do see folks that tend to go to various solution pages or even a demo page, but not submit a form fill. And more often than not, I've taken that as an opportunity to say, hey, I've actually not only seen you on our site, but I saw that you were almost there in terms of submitting a let's go ahead and have a demo but I, I i see you didn't take the plunge like um is there still interest if so let's go ahead and set something up and i kid you not more often than not they still end up taking the demo and so being able to at least see that first party intent they're on the website you can probably even see second or third party intent because they're looking at um maybe similar content that's related to the solution that they were looking at on your website, lean into that, right? And so, again, I've, I've seen that work um, in several occasions and uh, you just gotta take advantage of that data and, and be proactive and kind of use that right message, right time in, in order for it to stick. But without those insights, it's impossible to do that kind of activity, so. Yeah, and what, one of the things that marketing can do to help support that is mm -hmm. creating those pages that are mm. likely to be you know, used by someone who's shopping, right? Create some competitor comparisons. Yep. Create how to buy, how to do an RFP um, type content. You know, have a golden RFP uh, ready to go. Create ROI calculators and put them on your website. There's a ton of content that you can create that makes it more likely that the person who's consuming that content is actually in a buying cycle. Um, and so, you know, I would uh, highly recommend, you know, after you correctly position your product or service on your website to start creating some of those kinds of pieces of content as well. Yeah, our ROI calculators are definitely a favorite of mine. They seem to get a ton of traffic regardless of, of which business fires one up. But it's also more of a focal point this year um it has always been a focal point right return on investment you know what am i going to get back from what i put in and is it going to at least you know vastly exceed my investment but even more so when folks are you know i hate this phrase but trying to do more with less and things like that it's like roi is it, it's more it's higher on the priority list and so i think especially lately if you have anything on your website that either starts or ends with the word roi it's probably going to get some substantial traffic but it at least i think it kind of goes back to that research and influence right they can actually see tangible potential in an roi without having someone else tell them hey like have you seen this product it's guaranteed to 10x you know your marketing spend your media budget they can actually play with the numbers right do their own research and say all right this is definitely enough for me to have a conversation and they go in with a different kind of mindset and confidence of course you still need to convince them to take the plunge but i i, I couldn't agree more giving them more tools to not only do that research but effectively even have this it, it takes the less pressure off the seller too right because they're more familiar with what they're in, what they're interested in looking at and maybe some of what they're expected to see you just need to tell that story and drive it home so plus you're giving them your value prop right? yes when you're showing yes. them, hey, if you move this lever, it's going to increase this or decrease that, that's your value proposition, mm -hmm. right? And they can adjust that lever to what's right for their business as opposed to a case study, which is just kind of like their business, right? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think the ROI calculators have a, uh, a great value. It's funny that you mentioned the do more with less thing. Um, I, I hear that all the time as well. I always reject it. And I always tell people it's not about doing more with less. It's about doing less better, right? Mm. Focus on the things where you can really make a difference and do those things better. 
I think we might need to uh, rename the episode uh, to that phrase because that is that is incredible. But uh, yeah, it's no surprise to me that someone in a marketing role has heard the phrase "do more with less" <laughs> at least a time or two. <laughs> um, so yeah, of course, you know, I think we've used the word ROI many times, but I would be uh, remiss if I didn't use our other buzzword of the year in, our, in today's episode, which would be AI, right? Um, I, I think I mentioned in a, in a previous episode that I thought ChatGPT would be the word of the year. I still have my bets on that, but we do know in recent years, um, you know, artificial intelligence has been making significant strides uh, in marketing. And so, I'm curious, how do you see the benefits of using AI impacting, you know, ABM, um, but even more so just in your day-to-day uh, marketing strategies and could you even potentially share some examples or use cases um, where artificial intelligence has been uh, effective uh, in your um, ABM and go-to-market strategies? Yeah, so within my organization, we use AI in many different ways. Um, I'll start with generative AI because that's the one that you know is relatively new to this year, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but we're using generative AI for ideation, um, for a lot of first drafts of content. Um, I've actually used it to help with persona development, um, website copy, SEO, that, those kinds of things as well. Um, from a predictive AI perspective, I mean, that's been a core to the um, ABM platforms for many years, right? So, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's part of my account uh, prioritization model. Um, I say part of because it has mixed results. And the biggest problem with it is that most, um, all that I've worked for, but I'll say most, B2B SaaS companies don't have the volume that's going to allow for accurate predictions, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about a few hundred opportunities opened a year, and you're talking about, you know, whatever, 30, 50, um, you know, uh, closed one opportunities, how much, you know, is that going to be enough to, for any predictive engine to be able to make accurate predictions? I don't know, especially, you know, when you first launch an ABM platform, right? Um, At that point, you know, you're just putting the tag on your site. Right. How much data does the does the uh, the model have to do accurate predictions? Very little. Not and much. So I would say there's a lot of potential there, but I would almost say to anyone who's um, implementing an ABM platform, before you roll the predictive part of it out to your sellers, wait. Give it mm. six months, give it nine months, give it some time to learn from your data, your unique data set. Um, cause once you roll it out, if you roll it out and they don't believe it, mm-hmm. you're dead. Like they'll never go back to it. Man. Um, that one hit a little too close to home, Renny. I have to be honest cause, uh, it is a challenge and I actually like to, to stay on this point for a moment. Cause I, I do think it is, um, something that, that, uh, I find extremely interesting, but also very challenging, you know, as a lot of folks, We'll just use a, a common example, right? They sign up for an ABM program. They start off at a year at a time. To your point, it takes about maybe two to four months, depending on how quick and, and nimble the team is in order to get the um, the product at least up and running. But there still probably is a need for optimizations at that point. And, you know, your executive team's knocking at the door. It's been four to six months. They're like, why hasn't this been rolled out to sales? Why are we not seeing much value maybe out of some advertising campaigns that you got up and running? But those are also maybe a little immature at the time just because you're still trying to get things in a in a state that are ideal, but you at least need to be able to answer some of those questions and defend the uh, investment. But at the same time, it could be detrimental to the long-term success because – you know, you've rolled it out too early. You're trying to answer to, you know, these these questions, these requests at the, you know, that, that are coming from the top down. But, you know, in your personal heart, it's probably too early. How do you, I guess, what is your recommendation to folks? Because there's a lot, I'm sure, that would be listening to this episode that 
are in that exact situation. Yeah. Um, I agree with you personally. I think it makes sense to wait and really make sure, you know, even go as far as maybe doing a smaller pilot run with not maybe the entire sales organization, but maybe one or two users, you know, handpick a BDR, SDR, maybe an AE, maybe even a CSM too, if they're going to be using it for um, churn mitigation, get their feedback and input use that in order to optimize the platform because we've actually heard from a sales voice what they need to see and what they don't and then use that to scale but again by the time you might get to that point you have maybe have three months left and it's already time to renew um, but you haven't maybe shown as much value as as expected and so i'm curious you know outside of maybe making that recommendation to wait how do you convince everyone to get on that mindset knowing that there is a need to defend the SKU, you know? Yeah, so ABM platforms provide a lot of value outside of their predictive engine. Mm. And I would say start there, right? So start basically the way I started 10 years ago when I started using ABM platforms, I mean, this is 12 years ago now, um, but, um, <laughs> and, uh, and provide the, um, you know, that uh, data of the anonymous users visiting your website, you know, the, you know, uh, current platforms can reveal 20, 30% of your website visitors of which mm -hmm. you knew 1% before then, right? And so that provides a ton of value, you know, segment it for them. Let them look only at those accounts that matter, you know, whether that's, you know, industry or revenue range or employee count. You can also, you know, supply them with only the accounts that are visiting certain sections of your website. Maybe the account that's going to your blog isn't necessarily showing a buying signal just because they're reading about, you know, what is account based marketing or whatever, you know, for your particular industry. Um, so don't don't clutter things up with that right? Give them the account that's going to the pricing page or the account that's going to the demo page and not filling it out, or that's going to your ROI calculator page, or even just the product pages or solution pages of your site. Like bubble that up and say, hey, of all of your accounts, Mr. AE, these 10 are, you know, you know, last night were on our site and doing X, Y, and Z. And by the way, this is the regions that they, these are the pages they consumed. This is the regions they were coming from. So to make it a little easier for you to find the right people at those accounts, right? Give sales actionable uh, data that they can use to make their jobs easier, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I would recommend starting off. And trust me, I know that the um, draw to start putting a predictive model in the field right away once it's learned is, you know, almost overwhelming because we all want to see, is it actually going to work? Is it going to predict something? <laughs> but my advice is find out that it predicts something first, then roll it out and put it in. Yeah. The no, I, I couldn't agree more because uh, I can't tell you, and this happens, um, I mean, I don't want to say 100% of the time, but it's it's pretty close where, you know, we're, we're heading towards the tail end of implementation and onboarding. And the first question outside of maybe can we get some ads up and running is how do we start to get this in the hands of sales? And trust me, um, you know, sales adoption is definitely critical um, when it comes to, you know, owning and defending purchasing ABM especially when budgets are rather thin, you have to pull from other buckets in order to keep um, you know, the lights on, if you will, for an ABM product. And that usually ends up tapping into sales. And sales has a lot of influence and a lot of weight when it comes to you know, budget allocation. And so we definitely have to respect that and acknowledge that. But again, there, there, there's the need to do that. It makes sense and prioritizing it makes sense. But I think having... You know, for me, at least, if you roll it out, they don't adopt it. Like you mentioned, that's it. It's dead. They're not going to come back in three months and say, oh, you made these significant changes. It looks so much better. I think I'm going to give it a second try. You know, folks, uh, sales folks are very particular. And if they don't, they're not impressed by the tool, the first pass, uh, you're you're not going to have much success the second time down the road. So yeah, they'll end up going back to 
hey, I just had success with an insurance account. Let's target all insurance accounts. Mm -hmm. right? Like that's that's the, the old school way of prioritizing. Problem is, is that not every insurance account is in an active buying cycle. Just because yeah. they all have a need doesn't mean necessarily that they're all in a buying cycle. And so, you know, using the ABM platform to better predict which accounts across which industries are actually in a buying cycle is going to, you know, get much better results than uh, than just going after, you know, an industry that you had success in recently. Right. And it makes sense, you know, for the sales rep to, to kind of fall back into that comfort zone because they've gone through the process. They've been able to, you know, close win business and they're like, OK, I can I see the path to success. I just went through this, you know, three, six, nine month sales cycle with an insurance business. I know what strings to pull to keep someone in the insurance industry interested and, and take that investment and take that leap of faith. So let me find everyone else that's an insurance to see if I can continue to repeat on that success, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But to your point, if you can use not only that knowledge and success plus tangible insights that show you which accounts in that industry are of interest, you not only have an easier chance to to repeat that success, but it's more scalable that way too. And so, yeah, I I, I definitely agree that you know using a combination of that success with insights is a much better approach than just spraying and praying smiling and dialing to anyone that has insurance in their industry or company name just because you did have that success with someone else in that in that same industry that's that's quite funny um okay well I think we touched on this briefly, uh, which was, you know, do more better, right? Or, or do less better, excuse me. Do less me. better, yeah. yes. Um, which means, you know, you're operating under, you know, limited resources. And I think uh, it goes without saying that a lot of folks, you know, are operating under tight conditions. And so, but not only that, it's, I, I feel like it's still unpredictable. You know, I talk to different folks and some people are like, no, I, I think things are rebounding. Other folks are like, no, I, I don't see it this way. I think it's still going to be a little painful for at least the rest of the year, probably in the next year. But I think where I'm going with that is that it's quite unpredictable. And so it, it is. And, you know, the um, the problem is, is that it's unpredictable for our customers, too. Yes. And so it's very difficult for them to do budget planning and decide what new technologies to bring on board or new services to bring on board. Um, and so it makes, you know, um, sales cycles longer. Yep. It makes more people get involved. Um, it makes deals push. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just the reality of where we are. Um, you know, it comes down to the fundamentals, right? You want to help yeah. your buyers buy, right? It's not, you know, it's not sales enablement, it's buyer enablement. You need to give them the tools to help them buy more effectively, to help them compare more effectively, to help them, um, you know, get gain consensus within their buying group, to mm -hmm. allow them to be champions easier, right? All of the all of those fundamentals um, are more important now than ever. Yeah, I I I, I love the uh, buying enablement because we hear sales enablement all the time. You know, we I I've gone through a lot of sales enablement too personally as a sales rep. But you know, um, I, I think the combination of buying enablement and selling a problem versus a product are two things that uh, are really compelling, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, folks are buying products to solve challenges and scale business. And if you can't tell that story or message, it's probably not going to land, especially in, in a situation where there isn't an opportunity to make many investments and any investment they do make is going to be heavily scrutinized if it doesn't yield results. And so, but when they're really cagey with the budget and they have an opportunity to spend, make it easy to spend it with you instead of going through all these hoops, hurdles, takes, you know, five, 10 calls before they even get a price, can't even demo the product for a few calls in it, it in a time, in a situation too, where their time is, is valuable. Um, make it easy, take out a lot of the heavy lifting um, and, and some of the unnecessary noise in the process and enable them to buy. I, I think that's a, that's a, you know, 
a wonderful way to look at it. One of the things you just brought up, which um, is also key, uh, is once they do buy, mm -hmm. right? You know, you mentioned that they need to show value right away um, and long term in order to justify that purchase. Well, that's another side of what marketing needs to help with, right? Mm. We need to be able to help them define what success looks like, put the benchmarks in place to show that growth to achieving that success mm -hmm. over the course of that customer life cycle. And so you can't just stop with the acquisition. It really needs to continue all the way through implementation and then um, and then uh, use of the platform as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, the way I look at it, too, is post. Well, I mean, selfishly, because I am in post acquisition myself is look at, you know, how long has it been since they purchased the product? Which products did they purchase? And within the platform, are they using every single SKU? And if not, why not? Are they seeing results from the SKUs they are using? Do they even know how to calculate those results? And that's really to your point where you should be able to lean on marketing resources to tell that story, right? Of course, I can have influence on that discussion, but at the end of the day, I'm still I'm still wearing a sales hat. And so sometimes there's a little hesitancy into buying into that. But, you know, of course, through relationship building, especially in conditions like today, showing empathy definitely kind of helps break down that wall or that guard. But they need to be able to say and look at resources that say, how do I tell the story that the product I bought or even the tools that I'm using within this product are actually yielding value? And tell me, how do I uh, how do I tell that story? What data do I need to be looking at? How do I pull that data? What's a way to explain it to someone that's not in the tool? Like, show me the path to be able to tell that story. Uh, because chances are, especially if they're new or early on in their ABM journey, they haven't had to do that. And they're unsure how to take that leap and actually execute on that action. And it's going to be a required action at the end of the day. Yeah. They're going to need to be able to show something. And if they don't know how, it's a difficult conversation for both you and throughout your relationship. So yeah, I'm I mean, sure you have more comments on that, though. Yeah, I mean, in the in this era where, you know, um, customer churn is such a concern and yes. you know, making sure that, you know, you can um, turn your customers into advocates. You know, I always fight on any marketing team for a, um, a, a person whose role it is for customer advocacy. And part mm -hmm. of that is defining those success metrics and being able to follow that journey along the way and sh really show the value that you're providing. If you can do that, you will never you will almost never lose a customer, right? Because you're continually showing the value that you're providing, uh, you know, that your solution is providing. Yeah, that's great. So I'd like to um, kind of pick your brain a little bit around maybe what resources you use to continue to build on your ABM wealth of knowledge. Is there any kind of particular books that you've read recently that you might recommend to our listeners? Maybe a certain blog or newsletter that you're subscribed to? Uh, maybe a, a favorite podcast that you listen to on your spare time? Although I imagine between your work and professional life, there isn't much of that these days. But i um, curious what you would recommend in general, or maybe where you get some of your marketing uh, and ABM inspiration from. So if you're in the B2B SaaS space as I am, a um, book that I would recommend the most is called The Lean Startup. Um, it, it's an oldie at this point. Uh, wasn't when I read it, um, but um, shows you, you know, I'm aging myself here. But um, <laughs> it, uh, it really changed my viewpoint on um, product development. And I think that uh, a lot of the lessons that I learned from that book, I use, uh, I have used and continue to use in how I do marketing, how I build my team, how I launch new things into market. Um, it's really all about minimally viable products, how to fail fast and pivot quickly. You know, all these kind of cl the cliche things you think about now. 
yeah. uh, you know, that you hear about now, but <laughs> I would say that that was uh, probably a pivotal book in, uh, in my uh, experience. I have to. I uh, have not read that one yet, but I, I've, it's on my short list. Um, <laughs> you, you've definitely sold me on it. I, I like a book with a lot of uh, corny one-liners and cliches. Uh, it, it always catches my attention. So well, the, yeah, the corny one-liners and cliches have come <laughs> out of it, <laughs> but it itself was the core of of where they came from. Although not everyone knows that. Um, also, uh, there's a great video by uh, Daniel Pink about what truly mo- motivates us. Uh, done in an animation kind of uh, or an illustration style. Um, definitely top on my list. That was another like inspirational um, uh, piece of content that I consumed that I still reference every day to day. I think there's also a book too as well that kind of yeah. ties into the, uh, the video. Yeah, the video is shorter. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it does it cover most of what's in the book. Um, uh, I haven't yeah, read the book, I mean, but I've seen the video. It's a cadet. It's a much condensed version, but it gives you. <laughs> it really opens your eyes when you, especially when you're building comp plans and things like that for BDR. Yeah. Right. Like you know, it, it, it was always thought of. Right. Okay. Here's sales. You know, give them money, they produce more. Give them more <laughs> money, they'll produce more. Right. Like it, it doesn't work that way. It's not about money. Right. I'm not saying money is no factor in it, but watch the video. I think it's put, I think it's made, or I think it lives on the RSA channel, if I'm not mistaken. That's funny. No, it's, um, I'm going to age myself here. It's like the video is kind of like the Spark or Cliff Notes version of the book. And so for those (laughs) that want to consume it quickly, go ahead and click the video. That's fun. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. it, It is fun. So um, I guess last last thing I'd like to ask for you, and this one's kind of more for our listeners, is how can people get in touch with you after the podcast if they have further questions, want to connect with you, or maybe want more of, of your uh, of your knowledge as uh, someone that, that has been such a early adopter and continual user of ABM? Yeah, sure. So I love talking ABM. Um, I... You know, I'm an active member in like, you know, the demand based user groups and all that kind of stuff. Um, I love to learn and teach and all that kind of stuff. So happy to talk ABM, you know, any to anyone who wants to. Um, I would say probably LinkedIn is the best way um, if you just, you know, um, send me a, a connection request and mention the show. Um, that'll probably be the best bet. Perfect. Yeah, I would expect uh, your inbox to light up quite a bit after we release this episode. And uh, for good reason, you've had a lot of stellar recommendations. You can you can sense the passion that you have for uh, marketing uh, and operating marketing teams and even doing it with a uh, an ABM mindset. So I thoroughly enjoyed having you on the podcast today, Rennie. I uh, just want to thank you for being on the show and uh, You have a wonderful rest of your day. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was fun. Yes. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Sunny Side Up. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us and subscribe to our show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube and Demand Based TV. 